Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Z from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts around the world asking your questions and hearing their stories, all before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 5 of the Tomato Timer. Today we have with us Fernando, who's studying Economics, Statistics, and Data Science at Yale University. He's also the founder of ibphysics.net, which is a very useful website for students studying the IB program. And he's also joining us at Zenotes to help out with the IB program development with our own resources. So let's dive right in. Which course subjects did you study um, and which one did you prefer? Was it the TOK, CAS, or EE? Mm, okay, the course subjects. I, mm, I think maybe the CAS. Yeah, I think CAS. Because when I was doing the IB, I started out working at the at a, at a foundation called uh, like Children's Home. I think it would be the translation uh, to to English. And then there, I uh, started a project on my own. So like I started working there as a math teacher. I was basically responsible for implementing uh, web-based learning uh, on an NGO. They didn't have like any sort of like web-based learning there, and I started implementing it. And later on, I uh, developed an English program there. So I started it on my own and realized that since I went to the Swiss school, I had access, I had the opportunity to learn a lot of languages. I learned to speak Portuguese, English, German, French, and a little bit of Spanish. And d- due to that opportunity, I was like, yeah, I think I should like get back to the, to the community somehow because this is a really unique opportunity. And then I started an English program on, on my own there. And then we end up having 30 teachers and over a thousand bucks gathered for the NGO. And the course still goes on to develop something, uh, to start like as a teacher, then develop something on my own. And for that something to still exist today. Absolutely. That's, that's a really motivational, kind of inspiring thing for all of us to hear as well. Like, obviously, we, we hear from a lot of students that IB is a very challenging kind of program as well. What do you feel about that? I came from an A-level syllabus and program, and I definitely found that although I got a lot of in-depth knowledge of a lot of the subjects I was studying, so, for example, my math and my, like, for, when I got through A-level further math, I had so much more knowledge, like, very subject-based knowledge, but it meant that I didn't really have a lot of opportunities to do extracurricular stuff, especially stuff that was linked to my kind of grades. So everything I ended up doing, my whatever sports and, you know, even Xeno stuff, they were all outside my academic results and my, you know, whatever results I got at the end of it. So how would you, what what do you think, like, from my perspective, I, I'm obviously looking at IBM and I'm like, whoa, that would have been a cool way to study, go through my high school. But like, is there is there a balance? Should everyone consider it? Do you have a kind of like a specific criterion that you think that, oh, these students are more focused and more appropriate for that program? I think it is very challenging because it requires you to focus on it throughout the whole program. And it also requires you to do like a lot of work, especially in my case, since I was doing two curriculums at the same time, I had to devote a lot of time to doing the internal assessments correctly, all of that. And then later also study for the exams. So that requires a lot of work. I think the best way to strike a, a good work life balance is to plan ahead. That, that's the way I did it. Uh, the, the, the most important thing, I think, is to have like a concrete plan in which you have like, I, I use different colors for each subject. So I, I knew everything I had to study and everything I had to know prior to the exam. And I think that really helped me not to get lost and to know what I had to do. And I think that once you have that good plan and you know everything you have to do for each subject in regards to internal assessments, or uh, topics you gotta know that helps me a l- that w- will help you a lot and that helped me a lot. After that, that that is actually the reason why I started a website on my own because I had all those notes that I've I had been compiling throughout the IB. So I think that that's that's the, that's the recommendation I have for IB students: have a concrete planning since the beginning, and that will help you like have a good work life balance throughout the IB. I think some people start the IB diploma without this uh, planning and then the first year or maybe the first semester is kind of easy and then they have a hard time during the next semesters so i think that having a good planning is 
what it's all about. Yeah, so there was actually a question exactly about that. There was someone was asking, um, how do you manage your time effectively? So, um, and so this user says that he either works nonstop for several hours without a break, or he takes a break and it turns into a five hour binge watching session. Did you ever go through something like that? And if you did, how did you solve that problem? Do you have any kind of examples of, of something or a technique that you use in your time management that, that you could share with us? I think that the best time management tip I have is not to work like five hours straight because I think that's very inefficient. I think the best way the best way like to handle that is just to like have some sort of like tomato timer maybe. But like just just like try to measure what your own boundaries are. Because people are different. People may, maybe some people could focus for like two hours and get a good result. Maybe someone can only focus for one hour or for thirty minutes. So I think that the best way is for you to find what your optimal time is. And when you realize that you're getting tired, just give yourself a break. Just like shower or go to the gym or do something else. Maybe do an extracurricular that you enjoy. Anything like that. Uh, I think that, that that's the best way to handle it. That's how I did it. Uh, throughout the IB, I think I, I usually studied for like one to two hours straight and then gave myself a break. And I think that by doing that, giving myself like, I don't know, 30 minutes break or something like that after two hours, that really helped me not to fall into like a five hours binge watching season. Although although it could happen, it was like very rare because I, I was giving myself breaks. I think that those things happen when you don't give yourself break and you work for like six hours straight and then you, you're too tired to start something again. Amazing. Yeah. And I definitely agree with this idea of kind of complementing your study with something you enjoy and not making it like a six, seven, especially when we get to the later days closer to our exams and we suddenly think that we need to study for 14 and hours a day or something like that. And it never works. The, the effectivity of your studies, it doesn't pull through. So being consistent, as Fernando said, planning a long while ahead, even at the beginning of the year, if you know what subjects you're going to be studying at the start of the year, you can put together, OK, what the syllabus looks like, what are the topics that you're going to be looking at throughout the year? What are your plans? When is the mock exams timetable? When is the final exams? You know, plan ahead. What do you, when do you plan on finishing the syllabus? When do you plan on getting through the whole syllabus once? Then when do you plan on starting past papers? And even if you do this quite far ahead, it doesn't need to be very concrete, but at least that gives you a very approachable picture to your whole academic year. Definitely agree with well everything you said, actually. Uh, another question quite specific to IB again. When choosing three higher level and three standard level subjects, why is it necessary to take at least one science subject in higher level, even though I want to major in something else? It becomes difficult to study. Any thoughts on that? I think, well, for me, uh, the reason to take science higher level, I end up taking physics and math higher, and maths higher level. I think that the reason to do that is because many universities actually require you to take science high level or, or maths high level. For instance, I am actually studying economics right now, but uh, when I was applying to the UK, I was actually considering engineering. And I knew that most, uh, like the, the best schools require me to take physics and maths higher level in order to apply for them. So that, that's essentially why I took it. And uh, I know that for econ, I think you need to take uh, maths higher level as well. So I think you need to take those subjects because the universities require you to take them. I think Germany also requires you to take uh, a science or maths higher level. So yeah, essentially that that's why. All right, that makes sense, I guess. And then tell us a bit more about your experience studying at Yale, being at an Ivy League uni. Like, how does it how does it all how does it feel like? What is it, what do you do? What do you get up to? And tell us a bit about that. Okay, yeah, sure. So yeah, I, I actually throughout high school study at a German university because I went to the Swiss school and part of my family comes from Germany. And then I went to Germany and I did an internship there. And that internship was not that cool. Like the internship itself was interesting, but I, I really realized that the environment in Germany is not my type of environment. It's not a very creative environment and it's not also not an environment, at least in my opinion, for people who want to like do something big and who were like have this entrepreneurial uh, style or perspective about life. And then, yeah, I went to the US. I did a summer course there and really enjoyed it. So I decided to apply there. And then, yeah, I was choosing universities. And when I went like 
picking colleges. Uh, after you get accepted, you have a time to think about which one you're going to choose. And when I was visiting colleges, I really enjoyed Yale because he has a he had a, like a very friendly vibe. People there were very friendly and open, and they were like they were willing to cooperate with you. So despite the fact that they were very like competitive and probably got there because they had like multiple awards and all of that, they were all like willing to help you succeed. So that's why I went there. And when I got there, I realized it was that. So I met a lot of people from different countries. I think my class has over than 65 uh, different countries included uh, through its students. Yeah, so it was very cool to meet all those different people. That sounds like a very international university. That's, that's always an amazing thing to have if you're able to go abroad and go to an international university. So you have the perspectives and cultures and experiences and lifestyles from people from around the world. And you learn so much just from being around them and talking to them and learning together because you get to group activities. It's just like you suddenly see so many better ways and perspectives of doing the same thing that you've been doing for years and years. Yeah, exactly, exactly. At the same time, uh, the people there were not only different in regards to their nationalities, but also different in regards to like what they were passionate about. So there were some people who were like really passionate about math. There's some people who are really passionate about business, others who are really passionate about languages. So I think you can learn a lot from each single person and realize that each single person is like unique and inspiring. And I also like engage myself in multiple extracurriculars. I founded a startup there. It's called Golem Token. Uh, it's essentially an app that centralizes volunteering opportunities and also rewards volunteers with a cryptocurrency called Volum Token. And then the volunteer can spend the cryptocurrency uh, to get a discount at a local business or he, he or she pays the whole price, but then uh, the business itself donates to the NGO. So that's something I did there. I also am working as a peer tutor there. So tutoring for intro to microeconomics, uh, did some research and participated in some like social activities as well. So I think it's pretty cool. It's a well-rounded experience. It's very intense. And I love the fact that you don't have to choose a major since the beginning. So you can pick whichever subjects you want. And that, that's all been amazing and I'm really enjoying it. That sounds amazing. And how are you, are you able to manage all these things? That sounds like a huge bunch of things all in a single academic year. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think that the way the way to handle that is the same way I I handle my IB. Obviously, I've improved a lot on it. I I have to admit that at the beginning of the IB diploma, I didn't know how to do it very well, very well. And I think that if you start from the beginning, at the end of the IB, you're gonna be a pro in doing that, uh, which is like planning. So that that's how I do it. I I have like a plan, uh, my own, uh, my own computer. I I have like a plan that says everything I have to do every single day and what like when the deadlines are, what I have to do, how like and I sometimes also use some like pipeline uh, worksheets in Excel so I can have like a, I, I know how far I am from getting where I want to get. And I think that, that that's the way that's the way to handle it. So we don't get yourself lost because at the beginning of the year, you normally have much more time than at the end of the year, especially with finals. So if you have like a, a pipeline or some sort of planning, I think that can help you achieve your goals uh, without a problem. Actually, Fernando, it seems like you've been using some of the terminology you're using is actually very, um, very on in like the startup sphere pipelines and like kind of like um, release versions and all that sort of stuff. That's how all the tech startups are working and it's all about agile and being lean about whatever you're planning to do and getting stuff done. You know, we, we work in design sprints and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's really cool to see that you're applying those. Not only are you taking your entrepreneurial activities and like kind of rounding your experience at uni with that, but actually bringing that back and taking it into your, your, your day-to-day -day life and your academic life, as well as your social life. And, you know, because at the end of the day, the, the toolkits that are being created by these startups is that the, what's happening now in the world is that we all, it's so much easier to create some sort of new product or service, which kind of disrupts any industry right now. You know, we, we come up with an idea and it's possible to get a bunch of developers on it, get a bunch of people behind it, get a website set up, 
get it out and in people's hands, it's better and easier than ever before. And so as that has happened, everyone is kind of racing against the clock to create the best solution for any problem that exists. And so because of that, I'm kind of dawdling on, but what's happened is that we've started creating very, very, like very lean frameworks and very fast frameworks. That's just things that create and then not only create, but test and then deliver and get it among the market as soon as possible. So with that perspective, everything that's all these tools that are being created. So if you guys look out and research into agile and what those, what their like, frameworks look like, there's something called Google design sprints. And that's more applicable to people creating an application or a feature in, a, in an app or something like that. But if you can, if you read the analogy, if you read it, you'll see that there's a clear analogy between what they're doing and what we can apply to our own work in our own academic work or social things or whatever. So yeah, it's great to hear that you're, you're taking all those things into your day-to-day -day life as well. Um, what are the questions we have here? So is it worth it, do you think? So I think we heard a lot about your experience and what you're doing there. Would you say that the, the experience is worth, like, because it's a huge competition to get into those Ivy League universities. Whether it's worth it to go to Yale and like the effort you have to put through uh, high school to get there. Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it is. I think it not only like in regards to like, as I said, had, meeting all those amazing people that they had like amazing opportunities and amazing experiences and they can tell you all about that and like getting to know all these people that that's really cool. But it's not only that, I think it's also about like meeting some of the best professors in the world. Like I, I, my former, my, the intro to microeconomics professor when I was taking it is now the chief economics officer at the World Bank. My professor, uh, my macroeconomics professor next year, I won the Nobel Prize, the economics Nobel Prize last year. Uh, my finance uh, professor, I'm probably going to take his class either next semester or next year. He also won a Nobel Prize in 2013. So like you're you're meeting the like the lead researchers, the lead professors in many different fields. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really unique opportunity. So I think that in that regards is also pretty awesome. And like last but not least, you have like at the end of the day, at the end of college, you have like a an amazing network of people you know. Uh, I, I met a guy there who introduced me to a hedge fund manager here in Brazil, and that was pretty cool. And then the hedge fund manager introduced me to other people. And then I applied to a program by getting to know those people and got a scholarship from Brazil. So I think that all those connections you're building throughout your college career, they're going to really help you out later. And I think that's really unique from going to uh, a college like Yale. Yeah. What about what other colleges did you get in? Which what was what was your kind of selection from to pick at Yale? So like at the end, I was trying to choose between Imperial College London, uh, Yale, and Columbia. I was also considering Johns Hopkins and Georgia Tech, but like I think my my top colleges were uh, Yale, Columbia, and Imperial College. And then if I if I had gone to Imperial College, I would have to learn uh, engineering. And I was not that much set into engineering. So it's like, since I was like trying to choose, I was like, okay, I have to go to a school that will allow me to uh, choose my major later. And then I was trying to choose between, between Columbia and Yale. And I think, as I said, like when I went to Yale, I really found a friendly community. Whereas at Columbia, I think people were a little bit more stressed, stressed out and all of that. And also I liked the idea of living in a campus that's not, not like in the city. I lived in the city my whole life and I thought it would be cool to live in a place that's not like that much crowded and that much stressed. So yeah, that, that was basically my decision process. Yeah, if you were here in Imperial, like it would have been. The first thing is you're completely right. If you chose engineering, then you had to do engineering for the next three years of your life. Like there was no other option. And I think for those of, those of you guys like thinking about applying and thinking about between the US and the UK, that's um, that's definitely another, uh, I think the most important consideration that in the US you do get that flexibility in that first year to be able to see, um, you know, is that subject what you really want to study or do you, do you just want to explore further and see? 
um, okay, maybe it could be Bai, it could be Ken, it could be both of them, it could be, you know, there are lots of combinations that you can do. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, Fernando, that you, that your final decision that you're majoring in, what is it, data science and economics, that came, that came after your first year, after you explored the subject a bit more in detail at university and then thought, okay, this is exactly what I want to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I I got uh, I started college and then I decided to take an econ class because I was considering economics. I really enjoyed it. And then I realized how powerful data science can be and decided to take some stats and data sciences class in the next semester. Uh, enjoyed it very much. And uh, this is probably what I'm going to major at. But still, another thing about American universities is that you can take classes in many different subjects. So, so I, for instance... I'm taking German next semester, and I took psychology last semester. So I think I, like you can take a, a couple of different classes and classes in all different sorts of areas. So that's pretty cool as well. And then this will help you make a more informed decision, in my opinion. Uh, with regards to me, I get like one or two electives a year, and even those, I'm not really able to select any other subjects other than math because if I do, then my future option selections gets even smaller. So in in like at the end of the day like i love my university and i love my course but if you aren't 100 percent set on what you want to study or you're not ready to like take that leap of faith into a subject because i never i personally didn't like really love mathematics until almost, even like last year as in love math loving math is always but i mean love math at university and learning which field and which specialization i want to go down i only got that about last year and I realized, oh, this is the math I enjoy the most and this is what I want to do. So it's it was two years of hard work and just grinding out the foundations of what we need to know to then come up and be like, oh, okay, this is what I want to study. Um, and that that difference in the US sometimes is, is, is really important because I know a lot of friends and um, a lot of students have to then end up changing courses mid-year. And then that's that's not exactly what you want to do. Um, so that's that sounds really great, Fernando. I will ask you one last question and then we'll wrap it up because although our timer has, I think, passed, um, because our recording didn't start, so I just let it go for a couple more minutes. The final thing we want to ask is, what are some activities that you did in school that made your application really pop out? Okay, okay. I think, yeah, I, I think, as I said, taking part in science fairs, so it was the best. Uh, physics project in Brazil and I was uh, the best Brazilian in the South American competition and then they sponsored me to represent Brazil abroad uh, uh, in Denmark and I also won awards there so I think those uh, awards help also developing a website uh, my ivyphysics.net uh, website which is uh, merging with Znotes that also helped me a lot I think getting to uh, getting to Yale uh, I think doing two internships in Germany and having these international experiences, uh, learning different languages, all of that, I think those uh, activities helped as well. I also think that uh, my, my social projects helped me a lot. Uh, developing this course uh, for underprivileged kids in Brazil uh, and uh, the children's home, the English course, with uh, after implementing web-based learning, I think that also helped me taking uh, French was an extra curricular language I took. So I think that helped me as well. And I think that all those experiences combined, they allow me to craft a compelling application telling uh, the those who are going to read my essays what I wanted to do in life. And that was essentially to be a social entrepreneur, to do something related to what I, what I had been doing. And I think that's what I'm going to do in life. And I think there's another question many people are asking me to answer is whether I know the way. And the answer is no. I uh, Unfortunately, I, I don't. If you want to do something, just go ahead and try to do it. I think that's the best way to think about life. If you can, like, if you want to do it, just like, please do it. That, that, that's it. Because you, you will never achieve something if you don't try to achieve it. There's no way. So I think if you, like, really try hard enough, and if you go after it and you do something you love, you're going to be successful at it. And I think that's that's the way I handle life. I always do my best. And if I don't succeed, I just try again.
as this podcast continues to run. But thank you so much for being with us today, Fernando. It was absolutely inspiring to hear your story and to see like <laughs> all these awards and accolades and all these things that you've been involved with across the country, across the world. Uh, it's just really inspiring to hear. Thank you for being here. And I guess that's time for us and we will see you guys next week. Bye-bye. That's another episode of the Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Zenotes Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Zenotes and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education available to all, go to zenotes.org. Bye for now.